Dear audience, thanks for making it back here. As a reminder, please be very active. You can use the specially crafted Twitter hashtag, EIS15, and you can also download the app, which you got the invitation for in your inboxes yesterday at 3.30. So please check that out, download the app, and participate in our polls. For instance, this morning's poll, you can find it on the agenda in the program part of the app. You'll see uh, when you click on the session, in the top, poll. Answer that poll, and we'll display the results at some point. As well, for those who cannot make it to the entire day here today, we have a live streaming which is available on the Martin Center webpage. Please check that out. And uh, finally, to ensure the liveliness of our debates here today, we have totems all around the room. And these totems are here to indicate to our speakers that their maximum time of speaking, which is three minutes to make their point across, will tell them by flaring up that this time is up so that we can then open the debate to you, the audience. Thank you. And finally, I'd like to present our moderator this morning, who is the political advisor on economic and social policy at the EPP party, Juha Pekka Novala. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second debate of this year's Economic Ideas Forum. Our debate will be on the EU's energy union and climate change. We'll talk about emission reductions, but also how we can improve our competitiveness through doing this. Bearing in mind that the COP21 is currently ongoing in Paris, we could not have a better, and I also believe and hope, more exciting time to be having this debate than right now. The panel will start with a six minute kickoff speech, followed by three minutes interventions by all the panelists. After the initial round, I will open the floor for questions. I'm happy that the room seems to be completely full. Since we want to have a lively exchange with the audience, and I hope that you all want to chip in right after the first round. Without further ado, let me introduce to you our distinguished panelists and open the debate. The kickoff will be delivered by Mr. Jerzy Buzek, member of the European Parliament, chair of the Industry, Energy and Research Committee, former Prime Minister of Poland, and former President of the European Parliament. Next to Mr. Buzek, we have Mrs. Deidre Klein, member of the European Parliament and the Shadow Rapporteur on the Green Employment Initiative last year. Next to Mrs. Kloon, uh, we have Mr. Tom Van Eyland, Deputy and Acting Head of Units for Strategy and Economic Assessment for DG Climate Change in the European Commission. Um, next to Mr. Van Eyland, we have Mr. David Buchan, Senior Research Fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Next, we have Mr. Um, Brian Devlin, advisor on internal uh, energy markets at the DG Energy in the European Commission. And then we have Mr. Christian Eckenhofer, head of energy and climate program and director of the Energy Climate House at the Center for European Policy Studies. Mr. Busek, the floor is yours for the kickoff. Yeah, thank you very much, first of all, uh, for inviting me for this uh, panel and conference, and congratulations to the Griffin Martin Center and my friend Nicolas Jurinda for organizing uh, the conference because it's a very timely one. Two days ago, we started uh, our conference in Paris with the attendance of 150 leaders, well, top leaders from all over the world. Very important, first time in the history so many leaders in the same place. I don't see any timing there should be because I don't know what, what does it mean the six minutes. <laughs> okay, I will try <laughs> then. My topic or your, your topic, our topic is energy union and climate change, balancing security and sustainability. Saying security, saying sustainability, we say cost. So we have a triangle. Security, second, environmental and climate protection, and third, energy costs, industrial competitiveness. I started as a matter of fact six years ago in 2010 with so-called European energy community with three goals, common energy market, common research, and common purchasing of 
energy resources from outside of the European Union to be stronger in our negotiations. Now we've got energy union slightly wider. It means, first, first pillar, security of supply. Second pillar, common market in energy. Third, efficiency. Fourth, issue of uh, environmental and climate protection. We should not say that we would like to protect climate only. An environment is much wiser than the climate itself. And <coughs> joint research as a fifth pillar. Well, as a matter of fact, all of them are costly. Let us start from point of view of security. We know that for security is necessary to pay. We cannot avoid something like that. It could be helpful from point of view of second pillar because if we want to have a joint or common market, we, could, we should build something like hardware, investment in cross-border connections in the European Union, and software, which could be even more, more, more difficult because it depends on member states, transmission costs, uh, support scheme for renewables. Everything is very important if we would like to start trading on our common market. And third point, efficiency. Nobody is against. It's quite clear, but it could be also costly. We should use much less energy that, than it is as it today. And point number four, generally speaking, environmental issue, not only climate issue. Uh, well, it should help us lower our emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, achieving the 40% reduction in 2030. A bigger problem is how to do it in a cost-efficient way and technology neutral than to achieve 40% uh, reduction. We must it as cheap as possible uh, on the basis of, let's say, cost efficiency and technology neutrality because we should use our indigenous energy resources. It's absolutely necessary. And uh, if we don't achieve in Paris um, legally binding global agreement comparable with our 2030 strategy goals, it will be very difficult for our economy because we'll be uh, something like lonely front runner, not a leader. And this is what is at stake in Paris, as a matter of fact. Of course, fifth pillar could help us. Fifth pillar of your energy union because it's about technology. And technology could be an answer for, for everything. For, for more efficiency, less emission, um, uh, uh, well, costs uh, could be also delivered on on lower uh, uh, on lower um, uh, level. And let me say, we would like to open our market to to the United States. We know very well about that, and the energy costs at uh, American market are are much lower than in Europe if we want to be competitive, if we don't wa want to export jobs because of uh, carbon leakage or industry uh, leakage and import CO2 emission because it will be the result of losing jobs or losing our industry, we should go down and down with, with energy costs. So as a matter of fact, our discussion should be how to achieve sustainability, security with, with as low as possible energy costs and prices, because it's not the same, you know very well. Costs and prices. It's not easy to answer that. But we've got more than one hour, as I, I know, so maybe we could also support something. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me take next um, Mrs. Bloom. Okay.
she was the shadow rapporteur on the green employment initiative mm -hmm. last year. Yep. So what is the potential of Europe's green economy sector to create jobs while meeting these ambitious climate change targets? Well, um, there is quite an amount of potential there. And if you just start against the re reduced resources, the rising price of energy and, uh, and raw materials, which is really driving what we call the green economy. And of course, competitiveness and the drive towards be having competitiveness industries and in, uh, is, 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 is behind it all. So um, the 2020 climate change package uh, deals with the, the whole transition towards it. Towards the um, towards reducing our reducing our emissions, and, and of course uh, that inevitably has effect uh, on the labour market. But there is a huge potential for growth in the green area. Um, if you look at the water industry, it's estimated that a one percent increase investment in that area could create up to ten thousand to twenty thousand new jobs in the whole um, tourism area. I mean, I'm to give you examples now, we can transfer our high level ideals <laughs> into the real world in the tourism center, uh, tourism sector, um, nature, na Natura 2000 sites could support up to 8 million jobs across Europe, which is 6% of the, of the um, employable uh, uh, population in Europe. So, so they're the kind of potential, and of course, in the construction center sector, uh, if we're going to focus on introducing energy efficiencies, uh, addressing the, the, uh, the buildings that we have. Uh, so there's enormous potential there in, in construction in terms of um, insulation and using technology as well to address the skills. So I, thi I think you can say that industry itself is responding uh, to what's needed, driven by the high cost of materials and, and driv driven by targets that have been implemented. And then how can, how can legislators, how can we uh, help in that way or how can how can we work towards it? Well, up skilling of the workforce is very important. Both upskilling of existing employees, and we've come through a very difficult period in Europe uh, where you know, we've had such high rates of unemployment, particularly among young people, and indeed there's another sector as well, the long-term unemployed. So upskilling is, is, can be, is going to be important, and indeed uh, providing young people with the necessary skills that are demanded and required of, of all these new type of jobs. So th that's where... Um, there's been a lot of focus and it needs to work, every individual country needs to work for themselves with their vocational edu training and educational training structures. So, so you have industry and education working together to ensure that they do provide uh, the, necessary, the necessary skills uh, for, for green jobs. So the, and, and also um, we can do things like uh, taxation, moving taxation away from tax on labor to tax on green, green economy. Uh, th that's one way and also ensuring that there's green procure procurement, procurement of, of green process when, when, um, when authorities uh, or state companies are bidding for, or uh, replying or bidding for services that, you know, that there's a green element to that. So a lot, lot can be done, but there is potential there. And I think, um, I you know, the real world is seeing it and is working towards that. And as um, legislators at the EU and working through, through countries, we can ensure that through upskilling, providing the necessary skills and indeed using fiscal measures uh, that we can get to that point. So the potential is there and um, we all need to work in together to ensure that we provide the necessary um, skills and, and, and address that, that the requirements of industry. Thank you. And now, knowing that the, the new circular economy package will be out today, I'm sure that we will get back to this discussion a lot mm -hmm. more the in, the, waste, in the upcoming waste months. Area. Yeah. Um, let's move to Mr. Van Island. <coughs> Mr. Buzek mentioned um, the target and how we should, you know, that we should try to reduce um, our emissions, but try to make it sure that we do it with as little cost as simply possible. Um, do you think that the, the EU's target for reducing emissions is achievable? given existing energy supply and energy security um, issues? And do you think we can do it in a cost-effective manner? Do you think it will harm or increase our competitiveness in the future? Thank you. Uh, yes, I believe it's possible. And yes, I think it's needed to ensure competitiveness. I think these are key elements in policy development we have been putting forward at the <coughs> Commission. Uh, looking a bit at what happened in the history, I mean, last year, we uh, saw emissions decrease with 33 percent compared to 1990, and in that same period, we've seen mm -hmm. economic growth in Europe equaling. Doesn't work. We we, we understand, but we are, we hear because we are very close. <laughs> <laughs> I will restart. <laughs> 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 almost, 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 yeah. Room. 
Uh, okay, good. So the question was, uh, do we think uh, it's possible uh, and is uh, cost efficiency necessary? On both answers, I think the answer is yes, of course. Um, we see it technically, economically feasible, but indeed we need to make sure that we can achieve it in a cost-effective and fair manner within the EU. Um, looking back at history, uh, we've seen uh, su substantial reductions already in the EU. Last year, our emissions were 23% down compared to 1990, and in that same period, we've seen economic growth equaling 46%. So doing something about greenhouse gas emissions is not detrimental to our uh, economy. Interestingly enough, uh, often it's referred to that the economic crisis has helped uh, achieving the target. It's true, the economic crisis has certainly dampened uh, the greenhouse gas developments. But interestingly also is uh, some research done by the uh, European Environmental Agency trying to differentiate which um, <laughs> trying to differentiate, I'm not starting Start again. again. <laughs> 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 trying to differentiate uh, wh which are the drivers for um, reducing emissions. And they actually come to the conclusion that it was not uh, the economy that was the, the strongest driver, but it's actually technologi technological change uh, with energy efficiency in general as being key, but also, of course, uh, decarboning our energy mix, and here renewables has been the key driver mm -hmm. in the <coughs> EU. Uh, so reducing greenhouse gas emissions, there's a clear role for efficiency, there's a clear role for uh, changing our energy mix, focus on renewables. That's also why uh, I think from the Commission side we see this as a coherent set of <coughs> measures and targets. We did it already in 2020 and now again for 2030 we've proposed uh, a greenhouse gas target in connection with an energy efficiency and renewables target trying to do it in a coherent manner, trying to look at cost efficiency gains across measures. Uh, it's kept us in the energy union and the energy union goes beyond. Uh, it's been uh, already indicated, for instance, uh, the need to develop our internal energy market itself <coughs> will be important if we want to achieve these things in a cost efficient manner. Finally, a small word about um, Paris. Uh, I don't think the EU is alone. Uh, if you look at what happened in Paris uh, yesterday, the counter was at uh, 183 countries submitting their contribution to the Paris Agreement, representing around 95% of global emissions. Um, if you look at what it would mean for emission profiles, we see a significant deviation from, well, the emission profiles we saw only a few years ago as business as usual. An interesting element there, I think, is an assessment by the International Energy Agency that sees uh, investment in Investments in the power sh sector shifting largely to renewables. Renewables will become the, in itself the biggest uh, place to put money when you think about power sector development on a global scale. So again, if you look at a competitive perspective, being on the lead in that in Europe will also help us uh, in the long term. Finally, for Paris uh, itself, important for us, of course, is that uh, we ensure that the Paris Agreement allows to upscale ambition because what's on the table now might not be yet f uh, enough to really be on online with the two degrees. So we need to make sure there's a review mechanism in there so we can increase ambition. We need to have a long-term goal that can guide us and we need to make sure it's all transparent and accountable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ah, thank you. You're doing the job for, my, for, for me since uh, next let's take Mr. Buchan on renewable energy where you just basically finished off. So for the time being we have 40% of all the patents in renewable en energy sector in Europe. If, if I'm not mistaken with the number. But um, how can Europe's renewable energy sector be better structured to ensure market realities are reflecting in pricing or are reflected in pricing and in the market structure? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, thank you for asking me um, here and asking me that question. Um, I would say renewables are actually, in a way, all too well reflected in the market at the moment. Um, it, they are uh, in the electricity market, because that's really what we're talking about. Um, they are uh, renewable electricity is uh, zero marginal cost. Um, it's helping um, uh, when it floods onto the, um, the grid, it's driving wholesale prices down uh, to a point where an awful lot of generators are uh, losing money or not making any. Uh, and we need them to make money for new investments. So uh, that's the wholesale price. But the cost of the subsidy, of course, loaded onto consumers' uh, household bills, is driving up retail prices. 
So there's a very awkward sort of <coughs> scissors effect, sort of opening up, you know, the wholesale prices going down, retail going up. Uh, what can we do about this? Um, well, it's on the wholesale side, I think it's extremely difficult to, until we get storage, large-scale electricity storage, extremely difficult uh, to uh, see how renewables cannot have this perverse effect because uh, they are, in a sense, uncontrollable. They can't control themselves. Um, you know, the sun's shining, wind's blowing, etc. They, d they come onto the grid um, and drive the price down. Now, so that's extremely difficult to deal with. Um, uh, on the retail side, um, uh, I think there are some things that can be done about subsidy costs. Oh, I should add one extra thing, which is that uh, on subsidies, is that I do think that um, a, a lot of, there's a lot of triumphant talk about renewable costs coming down, and they are coming down, and long term that is a, a triumph. But the, uh, the, the uh, uh, and there's talk about them, uh, and strong evidence of solar costs coming down to grid parity, so matching, uh, more or less matching conventional generation. Uh, but the, 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 the difficulty is that um, because of the way they uh, come onto the market, until we can control them and uh, make them dispatchable with storage, they probably won't earn a living without subsidy. <coughs> so I see subsidies lasting for quite some time. Um, now, the, uh, so what's being done about to try and make them uh, sort of uh, modify the, the cost? Um, well, the Commission, through its state aid powers, is trying to um, do something about that, uh, change the nature of them, make it more market-related, uh, and also to put <coughs> balancing responsibilities onto renewable generators, just as it is uh, on conventional generators when they put the market uh, out of balance. And I see the yellow lights <laughs> flashing, so I'll end there. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Devlin, <coughs> you're an advisor on the internal energy market. So actually, I, I would have two questions for you. The first one is, where will the diversity in supply come from? How can we diversify, especially our gas supplies? And then the second thing is on, on Russia. And the, the now cancelled South Stream pipeline. Will Russia still remain as, um, as an important source of, of gas for us? And how can we also make sure that the energy will be securely supplied? Well, thank you very much. And um, uh, thank you for the easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> we don't deal with, uh, with easy questions here at all. Uh, no, no. Uh, just. Uh, for, um, for the member states of the European Union uh, and for the European Union overall, Russia is a significant uh, and enduring uh, energy supplier in, in many sectors, not just in gas, also in, in other sectors, coal, um, uranium, um, nuclear products, uh, and, uh, uh, um, and in some member states, uh, electricity. So uh, there is a whole range of different fuels uh, that have uh, their origin in Russia uh, and which make it into the European Union. Um, the European Union and Russia will have an enduring relationship whatever the future scenarios of the uh, development of the European energy market, not least because we have uh, borders with Russia. Uh, we will... Um, uh, always uh, have connections uh, to that country. It's specifically in the gas sector, uh, in any scenario for the future, uh, we will be importing more gas than we do today into the European Union. Uh, and the nearest uh, and uh, in the long run, possibly the cheapest supply of gas will continue to be through pipeline uh, from Russia and Russia will be a very significant in the top one or two 
significant suppliers of gas into the European Union. How the gas gets to the European Union is, is a very important topic uh, and a topic of uh, much debate. Uh, but we shouldn't lose sight of one thing that uh, unites both Russia and the European Union, and that is that we both have a common strategic interest in having reliable transit uh, and supply into the European Union. Uh, there are different ways of, of making sure that that uh, transit remains reliable. Uh, the European Union is very much committed to uh, Ukraine, and Ukraine has proved to be a very reliable partner to the European Union uh, for a very long time now. So uh, there are those issues that need to be dealt with uh, at a much higher pay grade than my own. Um, but uh, I think for the relationship between us and Russia, um, it is uh, a relationship that will endure despite the rocky uh, circumstances at certain times. And we shouldn't also lose sight of the fact that uh, for Russia, uh, the energy relationship with the European Union is perhaps more important to them than it is uh, to us. So although uh, uh, gas is an um, important commodity in the European Union, it is not a determining commodity. It is not something which is of existential value to the European Union and can be substituted in many ways. That may not be the case for um, some of our suppliers. and They will have to think of their future strategy to think about how they will transition during our transition to the future. Okay, thank you. Mm. And um, before we open the debate for, for the audience, let's take in Mr. Mr. Eckenhofer. Um, Paris. Mr. Busek already said that in case there is no real agreement in Paris, Europe is going to be disad disadvantaged. Um, so if no agreement is, is reached in Paris, what should the approach of the EU be in that case? So, so after all, there are easy questions, eh? <laughs> I see. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful uh, for that question. Uh, there is still a little bit of misperception on what Paris is and what it is not, and I think uh, Tom already alluded to this. We are in a very different world than in, in Copenhagen. We know what the numerical outcome will be. We know the reductions. Mm -hmm. They are all laid out in these uh, INDCs, these Intended National Determined uh, Contributions. Uh, so there will not be a surprise, and the ministers, heads of governments, as uh, Mr. Busek said, came in the beginning. They're not coming in the end. So that's a, an in interesting uh, feature. They, they're not coming in the end. So they're not discussing totally overtired at 3 o'clock in the morning some figures uh, which then they find out they cannot uh, meet. We know what's happening there. Nevertheless, it's very clear, but this also we know for some time, uh, that there will be very different carbon constraints around the world. There are countries are in different uh, stages of development, and countries take different uh, approaches. And I think one key element for the European discussion is, in Europe we have taken a price tool. You know, prices are weak, but in principle we say we go via the carbon prices. Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, a very different matter than when you take policies like regulatory subsidies and so on and so on. So even if you have a similar kind of carbon constraints, you know, economists call it then shadow price, it doesn't necessarily that all the costs are directly at the company arriving because there are means of playing it around. You know, we do some of this in Europe as well. You know, let's just be honest about this. You know, we have a little deals left and right and subsidies here and cost reductions there. This is happening everywhere. But there is a fundamental difference if you put the price we con we add, uh, for carbon because there you have a pass-through. Huh? The costs are in the product prices, while if you do other policies, you know, building infrastructure, uh, renewables and so on, uh, that is a, a different story. Yeah? But no surprises uh, from Paris as to the targets. Uh, there might be some surprising in all the rest, you know, the finance. The transparency will be very important. How much actually transparency is there in implementation and how much do countries look at what's, what's happening. And all these things will be discussed until very late, but not so much uh, on, on these targets. So there is no flashing, and I, I stop anyways. Huh? <laughs> 
must be the first one. Yeah. <laughs> and um, do we have any questions from the audience mm. at this point? I have to say I'm personally highly disappointed if that is the case. Any? Hello. Yeah. Ah, there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dirk Hudig. In this um, negotiation, they're talking about the developing countries getting 100 billion in transfers. <coughs> Where's that money going to come from, and how is it, and who's going to pay how much of it? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Dirk, you you have three guesses. <laughs> mm. Where does it come from? But let's be let's be uh, uh, a bit uh, you know more uh, nuanced. I mean, the 100 billion is sort of a, a ballpark figure, which is part of the, of the political uh, climate. You know, people say, you know, you have been responsible, so you have some element of compensation and, and so on and so on. So it's in politically the 100 billions are very important. Uh, I personally have my doubts whether all of these 100 billions, if it ever uh, gets there, uh, will actually be used and can be used. You know, absorption capacities in many of these countries is very, very low. We know uh, from the EU, Ireland, which at the time was, a I mean, it still is, was a very well-run uh, country, and the absorption capacity was about 6% of GDP. This was an advanced you know, OECD economy. Now you talk about Chad or any other countries, the absorption capacity <coughs> will be much, much lower. So actually, m much of that money may actually not be needed. But you should also uh, say that a lot of this money which we claim is on the table will, of course, be relabeled uh, money. Now that is really a big part of the discussions. Countries say, hey, we don't like that you <laughs> relabel it. A lot of it comes from the carbon market. Huh? Again, these are the political discussions that are currently taking place. How much of this will the developing countries uh, accept? Mr. Brooke, could I just add, just on this question of the, is that okay? The sound? Yep. Yeah. Uh, um, you can hear everyone. On the supply yeah. side of this, <coughs> not the demand side, the absorption capacity, but um, the, the Europe's advantage is to be able to have, have this EPS system, not very effective in terms of... Apparently it's not okay. Okay. <laughs> um, but always not always very effective in changing people's behavior, but it does raise some money. Not enough money because the price isn't high enough. But I just want to make the contrast with the, that the U.S. Um, has, for congressional reasons, had to go for executive re regulation and that means that it's, it's, it's difficult for the U.S. And I think Obama's having some difficulty getting any money out of Congress uh, for, for this climate fund. So there is an advantage in going for a auctioning um, because it produces money um, rather than regulation. Yeah, and the gentleman over there. <coughs> I should answer uh, the no, question. No, no, no. There's a gentleman <laughs> behind you. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. I have definitely an easy, an easy question. Uh, okay, okay. What are the chances of, le of uh, reaching a legally binding uh, agreement in Paris, do you think? Uh, well, uh, legally binding. Uh, if I may mm, try to, to answer the question. Well, mm, it's not only an issue of legally binding agreement, but also if contributions of the main emitters all over the world, like China, United States, India, could be comparable with contributions of the European Union. Because binding agreement on very low level for all the main emitters and high level for the European Union is not enough for us we can lose our competitiveness. Mm -hmm. So the fight, let's say, in such a way, in Paris is extremely important, of crucial importance. I will be in five days in Paris, at the end of negotiations for a few years as official delegation of European Parliament, and we are ready to explain to our partners, all together, almost 200 governments, as a matter of fact, but the most important is no more than five, seven, ten, together with Japan, Australia, Canada, well, maybe, maybe 15, the most important partners. 
the, the, the biggest emitters, rather countries which are, which are rich, generally speaking, for example, United States, or even China, Japan, Australia. So if we, if we could achieve legally binding agreement on the certain level, it's great. But on a very, very low level, it's not enough. We should think about that very, very seriously. Because if we, if we are ready to lose our industry, aluminum, steel, chemical, fertilizers, is stoichiometric relation, is it not possible to avoid CO2 emission if we produce fertilizers, for example? So they will leave European Union, and then we will leave jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the effect will be, because we would like to buy fertilizers, or, or something like, like that, steel, <coughs> will import CO2 emission, as a matter of fact. Because if we ask ourselves about uh, minimizing emission in the European Union, we are great. We can achieve 20% of uh, emission reduction until 2020. No problem. I think it will be not a bigger problem for European Union also. 40% CO2 uh, um, uh, reduction, emission reduction uh, uh, to 2030. But how to avoid carbon leakage or industrial leakage or exporting jobs and importing CO2? Because if we compare consumption European Union, consumption, we emit more than before. From point of view of production, we emit less. So we are very happy. But it's a global problem. Mm -hmm. So if we, from point of view of consumption, emit more, so there's no solution for us. We should achieve global agreement, global support. Also Brazil, deforestation, for example. All the companies which are active in Africa, in, in, in Peru, Bolivia, Brazil, and using uh, forests in many, many ways. Stopping, as a matter of fact, CO2 use, because our forests is, uh, let's say, CCU, carbon capture and use. <laughs> no, no, they're using. <coughs> so it is very complicated. It's not enough our 40%, not at all. So we're going to Paris for, let's say, sorry to, to use such a, such a war naming, for, for real confrontation, because we would like to save our planet. We cannot do it alone yeah. as European Union. We should convince the most important emitters mm -hmm. on the, on the Contribution, as, as, you, as you said, on the certain level. Russia as well, Russia. But we take responsibility for our planet, not responsibility for one continent, Europe. Let's take in Mr. Eckenhofer. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, legally binding uh, is not, uh, you know, can be many, many things. Uh, you know, the, the, these national contributions, they will be, they are largely binding under national law. Now, you can make up your mind, what does it mean? You know, some of the things are legally binding in Europe, and they are done, and they are not done, but they are, you know, plans banned un under law. Now, other things, like transparency, how you review, that will be brought into the, the global agreement, and that part will be legally binding under international law, under international treaty. But, you know, just be careful. Obama just said, and of course we know all this, it cannot be called legally uh, a treaty, an international treaty, because then it has to be ratified by Congress and they never get it past Congress. Huh? So the contributions, the real hard stuff, Mr. Busek was talking about, that's really done under national law, and then we can see how this is done. But let me just add one point, uh, Mr. Busek. I think it's very important. You put uh, us... China and India in the same boat. You know, in India, they are meeting 1.5 tons per person. We are meeting about 8, 9, in America, about 20. Now, I mean, the Indians, you know, if they have 1.5 and they make a big reduction, you know, there's not much 
which will save the climate there. So just be careful. There are very, very big differences, even, you know, even with developing countries. China is different. They are at our level now. Uh, but just India is really another case, and also GDP per capita. So it's sorry very, about very India, but we should not go to such a details. I agree with you. So sorry about India, but we've got Japan and some other countries. That's a, lot of them. Yes. a lot of them. Yeah. No, uh, many of them, yes, but there are some poor developing okay, countries okay. Sorry. Which, which, if we confront, okay. we should no write the, confront no the right ones. We <laughs> should not yeah. go to such a details, because our problem is very, very wide, comprehensive, deep. And we should sing, think about that very, very seriously. You want to come in? Yeah. Yeah. So, first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, we d you don't have enough energy in your battery. <laughs> <laughs> it's everything about energy. <laughs> in my case, is en <laughs> <it's> enough. <laughs> it's electrified already. That's something. <laughs> um, no, I. I Let's not go into detail, but like I said, and I think it's important, we need to recognize that the actions put yeah, on the table the make a difference. Yeah, closer, closer, closer. your microphone, closer. Closer yeah. again? Yeah, yeah. Yep, okay. <laughs> Nothing. It's becoming a struggle right now. Uh, no, but I think uh, what is important in Paris, and if you look at the actions put on the table and the, and the targets proposed by countries, there is a significant change in the emission profile globally. If you then look at what type of actions you see, you see large changes in investment streams. And they tend to happen in many of these, what you singled out, important countries. So just to say, I think you need to be careful how one interprets what is on the table and how an INDC is formulated, but that they make a change, that they make a difference, and that in a way we are not the only ones taking action. I think that's important. We were often criticized that on the Kyoto, we were almost the only ones left with the target. We will come out of Paris in an agreement where many people have put something on the table and will take action. So just to say, I think one which should also look already today at the positive outcomes of Paris. It's true. How can we, well, account for it, follow it up over time? These are important questions that still need to be tackled in Paris. Uh, and uh, to some extent, that will determine the success uh, for Paris on that level. Mm. Mrs. Clue, oh, yeah. sorry. Well, I just on the no. same topic. Let's on the same, yeah. okay. the same topic. It seems to me that... The legally binding aspect of Paris is, or the, the, the legal constraints, is the key negotiation. There is going to be no negotiation about the EU's 40% Obama's uh, uh, coal regulation, uh, the Chinese Indian plan. I mean, it really, the key thing is, will the, these um, national contributions, um, which are not going to be negotiated, but will they be made legally binding? And then the second uh, and probably they can't be because of the American factor. Um, the second factor is, of course, the review. And that's where I think um, the Americans agree it should be, you know, there should be a, a compulsory review every five years. The Americans will go along with that. We will insist on it, and it seems to me that's likely. But it's, it's a key, you asked a key question. Just one quick question from my behalf first. Um, Mrs. Kloon, uh -huh. as a politician, when you speak with, with your constituents, mm -hmm. like how much do they express worry for the time being? We know all know that Ireland is growing rapidly, and you're like the shining star in, in Europe for the time being. But I don't think we want to draw that attention to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> we do just like to be under the radar, maybe. Yeah. But um, <laughs> all the citizens, you know, when you meet them, is Paris something that, that is, is of concern to them? And how is like, you know, when you exchange uh, opinions with them, do they consider that if EU is making a great effort that we are actually trying to destroy our competitiveness? Or do they see the link that we can actually gain from this? No, well, I, mean, I would say that there is a concern about competitiveness, certainly, and Mr. Busek has outlined it in terms of in a global situation. You know, we need to ensure that you know, Ireland is competing a lot. It's an exporting nation. We export 90% of the products we create. So. And um, the U.S. is one of our uh, one of our major markets. Twenty percent of what we produce goes to the U.S. So you know, comp competition and ensuring that we remain with that competitive edge is extremely important. Um, so, from the business point of view, I mean, you would that they're very concerned about that and the implications it would have for industry and for business. But you spe say when I'm speaking to constituents, people, I mean, we ac you actually see it. We see it in terms of climate change. I think this time we have that people, population, understand 
what it means and understand what a reduction in global temperatures means for them. Mm. We see it through change in weather. We see yeah. it through unprecedented floods, we're told. We've had floods that would be one in 100 years, and now we're seeing those maybe every 10 years. So um, I think uh, individuals and people do realise the impact, do realise it's important, but want to make sure that, you know, everybody's, everybody's um, moving together and it's not just Europe um, in implementing targets that are, yes, achievable, but at what cost? Okay. Um, gentleman over mm. there had a question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Christian Forstner, Hans Seidel Foundation. Um, the point is, um, if you, Mr. Busek, say we go to Paris yeah, in a confrontational mood yeah, because we want to achieve a lot, yeah? so uh, we can only encourage you to be firm on this. Yeah? Because if we add up all the um, um, INDCs, yeah, uh, the <coughs> outcome will be far away from what we wanted to have. Yeah? The global achievement uh, should have been about two degrees yeah, in global warming. Yeah? But if we add up all these INDCs, yeah, we, will end, uh, we will come to about uh, three and more. Yeah? So it's far from being a, a positive yeah, of assessment yeah, of, of Paris. Yeah. So the way out, yeah, uh, in my view, is only yeah, to, to engage in regional emission trading systems. Yeah? And this we have to push much harder. Yeah, to, uh, we see now from China, for example, they want to uh, establish, yeah, coming from next year on, yeah, um, and, and a national uh, emission trading system. Yeah. And I think the European Union yeah, and the Parliament, yeah, that's why I direct this uh, uh, concretely to you, should push much harder yeah, to, to find links how to encourage regional actors, yeah, um, uh, states, yeah, to establish uh, emission trading systems. Yeah. And you should think about maybe to, um, uh, to find incentives yeah, in development aid, yeah, with the Green Climate uh, uh, Fund yeah, uh, uh, for the years, yeah, to find a link that uh, money will be only dispatched, uh, dispersed yeah, to, the, uh, to the states yeah, if they invest in an effective um, an emission trading system. Well, we cannot say anything except for full agreement, because <laughs> I know that your, your remarks about legally binding on international way is very important, but it's not enough legally binding. The certain level, because they are national contributions, it means that it could be very low at the end. So legally binding agreement in international way is not enough for us. We should, uh, we should try to, to, to force in some way all the other emitters. If we cannot do that, it will be not enough. Because what we want to achieve, what, what, what we would like to achieve, not more than two centigrade temperature growth in this century, is not possible if the legally binding agreement will not be enough, on enough level. I don't expect 40% like the European Union but certainly not 10% or, 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 or even 16 or in the case of United States. Should be much more. That's a problem as a much of fact. I understand it's better to have something legally binding than nothing, but it could not be enough. So I agree with you, well, legally binding, and our, our discussion will be about how to make it legally binding. Of course, you are absolutely right. But another issue from, from the point of view of our small and medium business, industry, what will be the level of legally binding agreement for, for, for national contributions? It's a very important question. As you should not omit something like that. Well, I, I, could, could I just, uh, I, I agree entirely with you that it's, uh, you know, what we have, the, these national contributions are inadequate in many cases and collectively um, very inadequate. But we are where we are. Um, okay. Copenhagen collapsed. It, there was an agreement basically in order to get everyone this time on the train, they just would come up with their own plans. And I just want to point out that there's, you know, don't think that Paris is going <coughs> to, there'll be going to be long negotiations, but they're not going to be about the level of, uh, unless I'm completely wrong, 
um, of uh, the national contributions. The idea is to get everyone on the train and then um, try to accelerate the train in sort of five-year periods, get people to up these targets. That's all. We should have probably underlined <coughs> from the very beginning, we should have underlined that we would like to be a lonely runner mm. and should tell it very, very openly because we cannot help the global issue in, in Europe only. Our 40% is fantastic mm -hmm. and we can achieve that. Maybe even more, I wouldn't like to say that, but it's almost nothing from point of view global issue. First time in the history we have global threat because desulfurization was, an, was a local problem or waste is in our rivers or even, even seas. Local problem. Now this time is global problem. Doesn't matter if emission is from, from Africa or from Asia or from, from uh, deforestation. It's also emission. Something like emission from deforestation. Doesn't matter. Anyone who wants to in this? Question, um, question there behind. We'll take this one and then there is another question over there. So let's take two questions at the same time now. Yes, good morning. Good morning, Nick Crosby. Uh, I'm going to take the discussion slightly back to the question of security, which seems to have been uh, uh, avoided. We've talked a lot about COP, which is a global threat. Uh, climate change is a global threat and it's medium term. But there are near-term energy threats, and the elephant in the room is Russia. And I would like to ask the gentleman from the Commission, who seem to be saying to us that because there is great interdependence between the EU and Russia, that somehow this wasn't really an existential threat. But I would say back to that, that one of the things we have unfortunately learned in our European history is that mutual interest is no guarantee of security, and that when ideology, and perhaps a non-total rational actor is in the game, we must be prepared. So I would ask the audience to think more about how the security of supply and energy is connecting to the wider longer term problem that we've been talking about. Thank you. And the second question before I give the floor to Mr. Devlin. No. Thank you. My name is Constanza Ada from Green Budget Europe. Um, I would like to have uh, a question and a comment. Um, the comment is, um, we've seen just in the discussion, and thank you for the important discussion, um, how problematic the UN governance will be um, and how difficult it will be in terms of um, achieving binding targets in Paris. And just to make people aware that the 2030 targets will be for renewables and energy efficiency in a way the same. So um, it's a question to the Commission. Will we have a legally binding reporting process by 2020 for the Energy Union? Because I think this is the only kind of governance process that could allow us perhaps to really enforce the targets that the EU, is, EU, and, uh, EU sets itself. And um, secondly, um, until now, um, the climate and energy targets until 2020, and I think this is also important because we now talk a lot, uh, a lot about 2030, but until 2020, they are governed under the European semester in the framework of Europe 2020. But this year, what we have seen is that the climate and energy goals were shifted towards the energy union. Now, as far as I understood, the energy union is not operational until 2020. So my question is, what happens with very important policy measures like looking into tax shift that were just mentioned uh, by Mrs. Kloon and looking into, for instance, fossil fuel subsidy reform, uh, just to remember the audience that we have un well, un under IMF numbers, 320 billion of fossil fuel subsidies each year. This is double of the EU budget. So what happens with this kind of important policies until 2020? Thank you. Mr. Devlin, would you like to start? Well, one first of, of all, um, one of the easy questions again. Another one. Um, from the gentleman over there, let me first say that I, I don't share the, the premise of his question. Um, I think that's the, the starting point. Um, 
On, on the uh, energy relationship between the EU and its uh, external suppliers in all sectors, whether it's uh, gas, oil, um, the nuclear sector, or, or any other part of it, um, technology, there are long-standing relationships that have to be managed. Uh, and uh, I think overall the member states, uh, the European Union, do a very good job of managing uh, those uh, relationships. As with all relationships, uh, there are difficulties at times um, which are unrelated to the energy sector, but we should bear in mind that the European Union's internal energy market is enormously resilient and is becoming increasingly resilient to uh, external shocks. Uh, and if there is, for solidarity, a core uh, objective within the European Union, it is to make sure that the resilience is much greater uh, today and in the future than it was in the past. And we are seeing in the um, energy union process a strengthening of, uh, for example, interconnections, the strengthening of the role of markets, uh, the strengthening of uh, the response mechanisms put in place by member states to deal with uh, external shocks, whatever they might be. Uh, and uh, although uh, <coughs> there is a focus on, on a particular relationship today, we should bear in mind that there have been difficulties in our relationships uh, with uh, gas supply, uh, for example, with North Africa through the Suez Canal, uh, uh, coming from the Gulf for the LNG, there are also difficulties. But it's only through diversity uh, and internal market resilience that you can deal with these uh, issues. And what is true for the gas sector is also true for the oil sector, is true for um, electricity as well. Um, so I think if we strengthen the internal bonds between member states, we increase the levels of trust between member states, and that's done through institutions and working together. If we do all of that, uh, our external relationships are manageable in their entirety although there is often a rather strong focus on one particular relationship to the exclusion of all other of the many risks that the European energy sector faces on a daily basis and deals with. So I think that is a global um, perspective that is often lost when discussing this issue. And how about the second question on on the energy union from now until 2020 and uh, reporting procedures. If Tom would like to take up that point, but uh, I would like to just say one thing. The energy union has started. It's not going to be in place in 2020. It is already there. The issue of governance is already in discussion with member states and the reporting issues are already in discussion with member states and the European Commission is also working on these issues. Uh, uh, currently, but on the specifics related to um, uh, climate change, I'll, I'll, my colleague uh, Tom. Let's take Tom here and then we get back to Russia, I believe. Mr. Bursak. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take Mr. <laughs> Mr. Van Island first. <laughs> oh, I, I don't think I'm the specialist on the Russian energy security. On the, uh, the question related to um, the 2030 climate change and energy framework um, and uh, how the governance will be done, I think in a way we've been very clear. Uh, we've said that uh, energy efficiency will continue as it is today as an indicative target, but we will foresee also the measures to achieve it. Um, on renewables, the change is indeed that we move away from national targets, but we see it as a binding target at the EU level. Important in this context is, as said before, we are creating a governance system. We are creating a system where member states uh, will have to plan and report how they achieve uh, their, well, their combined uh, actions uh, in a coherent way. That's one. Two, um, we'll need to see how to achieve the renewables target, uh, and that indeed is foreseen for next year when we will come out with uh, a renewable energy um, communication. But for the European semester, the remark was uh, basically to what extent uh, one can uh, operationally guide from the Commission side uh, member states on key issues related to the energy union. There I would like to refer to our recent uh, State of the Energy Union, where you do find uh, comments 
uh, and indications uh, of the Commission towards member states where we think that they are uh, well on key issues related to the energy union. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Buzek? Uh, well, very shortly, because I would like to, to answer all the questions, because we, we've got um, all the other participants of the panel discussion. Mm, but it's very important issue, renewables and efficiency, uh, binding target for, for the member states. I support entirely both of them. I would like to, to say anything more. But we should not confuse the goals and the tools. We, we did something like that some years ago with biofuels. And we wanted to have 20, 25, 30% biofuels because we thought it is a cutting the emission. But at the end, not at all, in the case of first generation of biofuels producing of ethanol. And now we are going back and back with such idea because we confuse both of them, tools and the goals. It's the same in your question. I am not against, of course, uh, efficiency. It's fantastic. Renewables as well. But let us take into account that the most important is emission. Mm. not the lev level of, uh, of uh, uh, renewables. Emission to cut down 40% is the most important. In some member states, it could be done by nuclear power station. I know that Greens are strongly against. I can also support nuclear power station. We should be secure, safe, and so on. But this could be also a result. Uh, could, 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 could give the same result. So we should take care about our goals. Our goal is quite clear, to cut down emission. About um, another issue of crucial importance, I think. Um, in the European Union, we build sometimes tremendous, big, incredible, fantastic projects. We change idea in, into activity like energy union. The spirit of energy union, solidarity, is fantastic. Five pillars. And suddenly, what appears? Such a project like Nord Stream 2. That's everything against energy union. We achieved something like political agreement. We are doing everything to support five pillars. And we've got on the table Nord Stream 2, with enormous tension between the member states, like it was 12 or 10 years ago. We forgot Nord Stream 1. And we use not more than 60% of existing pipelines from Russia to the European Union. We've got three of them, Nord Stream 1, Yamal, through, through uh, Belarus and Poland, to the European Union, and uh, Ukraine pipeline, Slovakia, and to European Union. We use not more than 60% of capacity. So what for the Nord Stream 2 is a question. Well, it is much better for us from point of view of diversification of energy resources, suppliers from outside the European Union, and roads of supply to build our LNG terminals. I spent a few days in the United States to open the American markets, market to LNG export from the United States to Europe as well. It's a very cheap uh, uh, um, gas, natural gas in, in American market that you would like to export it but it's still licensing formula, to open the market and to build LNG terminals. It's much better from point of view of our, our uh, uh, well, security and also prices. 60% of capacity we use. So what for in new projects against our solidarity 
and as the spirit of the uh, energy union, spirit of the energy union. It's a very important question. In the European Parliament was a long discussion with Commissioner Kanyeta and uh, overwhelming majority of my colleagues from the European Parliament said absolutely the same. And the conclusion you can find in, in the internet, conclusions of our meeting, said by Commissioner Kanyeta, no support from the level of the European Union, both financial, either financial support, no, and any other, no derogation possible, because it's against Euro uh, energy union. It was a result of discussion in the European Parliament. Thank you. And yeah, Christine, let me just uh, second uh, what was there said. What you mentioned as energy threat, energy security threat, I, I, I could also, I would prefer to call it energy security risk, uh, is very much of our own making. And you just mentioned uh, Nord Stream, and there is a lot of activities we, we can undertake in a, in a spirit of solidarity. Our se energy security would be uh, much better. So let's first look at this. And one point uh, Brandon didn't mention, the energy is now for the first time and the EU global strategy, and it becomes where it should be also part of the, the foreign policy aspect. I think we're actually on not such a bad way. And, uh, and you know, if, if we get this, this right, uh, and I think we're getting the, the measures right, it could be one of the, the successes. Uh. At this point, I'm afraid I have to end the panel. I want to thank the speakers and, and the audience for the questions and for the, for the lively debate, for the exchange of ideas and opinions. Um, let me end by the panel by quoting Robert Schumann. Hmm. Europe will not be made all at once no. or according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements which first create a de facto solidarity. So at least to me it seems that creating the energy union and tackling climate change jointly are examples of those concrete achievements and building that solidarity. With these words, I believe next we have a coffee break and then we continue with the forum. Thank you.